Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. In our last video, we talked about the inter-service rivalry between the Imperial Army and the Imperial Navy that plagued the efficiency of the entire Imperial military. It's a pretty common occurrence in most military organizations, especially ones that don't separate the political power from the military command structure. But a far larger problem that the Empire faced was the fact that it was simply too large of an organization. Any organization that grows to a certain size will face new challenges. Here in the United States, we oftentimes view our military as a whole as the most powerful in the entire world. Its logistical abilities, intelligence gathering, NCO Corps officer schools, R&D capabilities, rank amongst the best in the world. But when it comes to individual pieces of kits or vehicles, it's just not economically feasible for the massive United States military to always equip its soldiers with the best possible piece of equipment. I mean, for sure, the average American rifleman is better equipped than its Chinese or Indian counterpart, two other military forces that field massive ground forces. But compared to our Western European allies, who mainly field very small but advanced defensive forces, there are going to be pieces of kit that the U.S. military uses that's going to be a little bit antiquated compared to what they're using. For instance, the U.S. military lacks a modernized infantry and fighting vehicle. The best thing we have right now is maybe the M2 Bradley, or I guess certain variants of the wheeled striker could fit that role as well. But neither of these IFV solutions are up to the standards of more modern vehicles like the German-made Puma or their export-oriented Lynx, which apparently has a rail gun and has active deflector shields. I mean, the Germans might not spend that much money on their own defense, but their military industrial complex creates some top tier vehicles. Not only does the United States face cost restraints and delays in fighting the next generation IFV for their own military force, our previous two engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan were mostly fought against small insurgent groups armed with small arms. IFVs didn't really need to play a huge role in these kind of battles, nor did the main battle tank, as a matter of fact. These were very different conflicts compared to, say, what the Ukrainians are facing right now on their own eastern border, where you have these giant open plains where non-mechanized infantry are basically sitting ducks for artillery or enemy tanks. But even if the United States were dragged into a war against a near-peer military force, the Bradley or whatever IFE the U.S. military digs out of storage will be able to lean on the network of weapons and technology the United States fields in battle, making it far more efficient as a weapon system when compared to if the Bradley was just deployed by itself. Ultimately, military procurement is a risky business. It's like investing in futures. You can make an educated guess about what you think will happen, but you don't know exactly what avenue of investment is going to actually be successful. And so the larger your military force is, the more varied its mission is, the more difficult training and procuring weapons and creating doctrine will be to make sure that that military force can handle all of the varied situations it's going to face. And if you think the United States military, which is deployed across the entire planet, is facing some difficult challenges, then wait until you hear what the Galactic Empire has to deal with. The Empire has to patrol an entire galaxy, has to face both known challenges and also unknown ones, which can range from undiscovered hostile species in the outer room to even extra galactic invaders with technology that no one's ever seen. You know, Emperor Palpatine in Legends was said to have built the Death Star and his massive fleet of Imperial-class Star Destroyers in preparation for an invasion from the Yuzang Vong, a terrifying horde of aliens who had escaped their own destroyed galaxy and were looking for a new home in the Star Wars galaxy. Now, the more current canon explanation on why the Empire's military looks the way it is can be explained by Wilhuff Tarkin's doctrine. This was a military and political theory that believed the only way to achieve stability in the galaxy was not by the quantity or quality of your military force, but by creating a threat of force so massive that it served as a deterrent for any kind of dissent. Things like the Death Star were basically designed to scare the entire galaxy into compliance. And so instead of having more modern starfighter carriers like an upgraded version of the Venator class Star Destroyer, you have the Imperial class Star Destroyer, a massive heavily armored and heavily armed battleship essentially that was designed for relatively limited line of sight battles. They were however great as fire support platforms and were a fearsome sight when they appeared over a planet. The threat of orbital bombardment was enough to scare most rebels into hiding. The Empire would actually build 25,000 of these one mile long Star Destroyers and this is a great example of the Empire splurge in a completely unnecessary way. Each sector fleet in the galaxy deployed a handful to a dozen of these capital ships, which made up the backbone of the galaxy's security infrastructure. A huge amount of resources were also invested into creating a logistical network to supply this very resource-intensive ship. 
Now we've given many different reasons in many different videos why the Imperial Class Star Destroyer was a terrible design. A much more practical use of all those credits would be to deploy a higher quantity of much smaller vessels that were roughly a tenth of the size of the ISD and far less resource and manpower intensive. And so as a result of this very expensive Star Destroyer program, the Empire had to cut corners and costs in other areas, and this can be seen in the TIE Fighter program. From a design standpoint, the TIE Fighter was a greater engineering marvel than even the Death Star. Its engine, for instance, had no moving parts, it drastically decreased wear and tear and maintenance costs, and its production line was perhaps one of the most efficient examples of mass production since the creation of the B-1 battle droid and a joint venture between the Techno Union and the Geon Oceans. And so the per unit price of one of these TIE Fighters was ridiculously low, like under 60,000 credits, or about a third of the price of its rebel competitor, the X-Wing. And three TIE Fighters could easily take out an X-Wing. As a matter of fact, one TIE Fighter could go up against an X-Wing and probably defeat it as well. I mean, Imperial pilots were usually better trained than their Rebel counterparts. But because the TIE Fighter was a budget design, it was severely limited in its range and offensive and defensive capabilities. It couldn't actually engage the Rebels in many battlefield scenarios, which made it kind of useless. The TIE Fighter lacked a hyperdrive, shields, heavy weapons, and so it was mainly delegated as a fighter escort or short-range interceptor. And so it really wasn't a threat to enemy capital ships, and it couldn't pursue Rebel snub fighters into hyperspace. And they were also heavily dependent on their carriers for transport. And so the Rebel Alliance, which was still growing at this point in time, was able to specifically design their Starfighter Corps to combat the Imperial Navy's biggest weaknesses. The Empire fielded massive battleships which lacked adequate point defense weapons and short range fighters that needed to be deployed from inside of the ship because they needed to be stored inside during hyperspace travel. And so there was always a window in which rebel pilots could operate almost unharassed against Imperial ships. And by the time the TIE fighter squadrons were scrambled, it was already way too late. The rebels would be long gone. I mean, for most of the war until maybe the Battle of Endor, the Rebel fleet was like 1%, maybe less than 1% the size of the Imperial Navy, but it was very well built and it was the perfect counter against the Imperial Navy. After a series of stunning defeats by the much smaller Rebel Starfighter squadrons at places like Scarif and Yavin 4, the Empire started trying to develop its own new Starfighters to combat the growing Rebel threat. The Empire was massive though, and the Rebel cells and fleets were highly maneuverable, able to strike out and disappear and reappear in different parts of the galaxy. The Imperial military complex was far too slow to respond to this Rebel threat, and by that time, the TIE Interceptor and TIE Defender was ready for mass deployment, it was already far too late. These later Imperial fighters were in fact superior to their Rebel counterparts, but replacing a galaxy-wide Starfighter Corps took several years that the Empire didn't have. Even the stopgap measures that the Empire used, like equipping Gazanti-class cruisers, which were essentially civilian freighters with weapons and armor, didn't really work that well. The Empire basically gambled with the Tarkin Doctrine and they built out infrastructure and a military force that wasn't really designed for the threats that it faced. And we see this at every level of the battlefield, including in the ground war. The Empire also fielded ridiculous vehicles like the AT-AT Walker, which towered over the battlefield and definitely struck fear into the hearts of civilians and untrained militias, but to a hardened rebel anti-tank crew, it was an easy target. The ATST also proved to be a very vulnerable design that wasn't really properly designed for the modern battlefield. And so as a result, you would see the Empire utilize regular speeders and armored transports on the battlefield, things that weren't significantly that much more advanced than what civilians or the rebels were using. And so while the Empire was massive when compared to the Rebellion, the quality of their troops were so low that in ground battles, they were near peer adversaries to the rebel infantry. And so the biggest mistake that the Empire would make here is not only investing in the wrong type of military force, but investing so heavily in the wrong military force. They're already so heavily leveraged to field a military force for conventional near-peer enemies that they were unable to switch to anti-insurgency tactics. I mean, this is why the ISB was elevated to near-god-level authority and able to take over conventional military units after the Aldani raid. The Emperor literally had no other solution to combat these small, maneuverable rebel cells. The point here is a uh, large peacetime military isn't always the best idea. I mean, sure, it keeps your domestic industrial military complex 
well fed and it gives them a lot of jobs so that they can continue upgrading their infrastructure and be prepared for that eventual war that does happen. But since you never know what the next threat is going to be, it's better to just have a large reserve force and a very flexible military industrial complex that can create the weapons you need once the war starts. I mean, the Imperial military that we see in Andor wasn't really designed for anything practical. It wasn't even useful for keeping the peace, which was the Empire's main job before the Civil War even erupted. And that's probably why the Galactic Empire only lasted for maybe two decades before it just completely disappeared. It just spent way too heavily on a military force that it did not need. The Galactic Republic, on the other hand, survived for thousands of years, and it got invaded all the time, but at the core of its strategy was keeping a relatively small peacetime military force that acted as a quick reaction force that would buy the Republic more time while the military industrial complex ramps up production and creates an actual larger wartime military force. There was also a heavy reliance on local and planetary defense forces, which were usually subsidized by the federal government. These smaller forces had limited capabilities, but usually could defend their local systems well enough and long enough for the federal military force to eventually arrive and relieve them. The Republic was also quite practical in how it approached large enemy forces. Whenever the Sith Empire or their proxies, the Mandalorians, invaded the galaxy, the Republic would oftentimes allow the Adoram territories to absorb the kinetic energy of these invasions. The enemy forces would expend manpower and time taking over these more sparsely populated areas and usually have to leave garrisons behind to guard them. These border regions would eat up enemy resources and manpower and buy the Republic enough time to get their industrial might into order. And the Republic economy was always considered massive compared to any competing force. I mean, the Sith Empire was much smaller in size. And so it would only take one or two years before the Republic military eventually became larger than whatever invasion force was trying to take it over. A lack of a massive peacetime military force also meant that the Republic federal government could spend more money on improving infrastructure and generating wealth. Military procurement from planetary defense forces and other local defense forces would keep the military industrial complex busy and make sure that it could continue to upgrade its own factories. And this basically was a much better strategy than what the Galactic Empire tried to do. And sure, the Old Republic did use the same hammerhead cruisers as their main capital ship for like 4,000 years, and these were small and not that intimidating vessels, but it essentially meant that the Old Republic spent very little on R&D and acquiring new ships, and essentially just continued to upgrade their fleet over the years, which was a great cost-saving measure. This kind of reminds me of the M3 Sherman tank fueled by the United States during World War II. It definitely wasn't the sexiest tank on the spec sheets, but it was by far one of the most mass-produced tanks, and um, it was just available when other tanks weren't. And this is one of the ways that the United States was able to win the war through sheer economic power. Anyway, guys, that is my criticism of the Galactic Empire military. Uh, sometimes having a really large military force is going to create a lot of issues. Let me know in the comment section below what you guys think. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.